Hey everyone! As many of you know, I make cosplay braided tutorials here on my YouTube channel, and for the most part, I use my own natural hair. I've always wanted to demonstrate that it is possible to create ornate and feminine hairstyles with your own hair, since I know that for some of you, buying additional hair is a luxury that you can't currently invest in. I also think there's a lot to be said about embracing one's own natural beauty. But every once in a while, I do use clip-in hair extensions, especially if I feel like I can't do a character's hairstyle justice without them. And with cosplay and con season popping up, I thought it might be fun to talk a little bit about how to use and wear hair extensions. I'll be showcasing a set from Irresistible Me, which is a company that I've worked with before. I recently reviewed their 8-in-1 curling wand, and I'll have that linked below. I really loved that tool, and since I had such a pleasant interaction with that company, I thought I would try out another of their products. So quick disclaimer, these were sent to me for free, but I'm not being paid for this video, and all the opinions in it are my own. Now that that's out of the way, let's talk a little bit about the history of hair extensions and wigs, and the different kinds that you can buy on the market. Apparently, the first extensions were worn by ancient Egyptians, and they were likely made out of human hair, wool, or palm leaf fibers. A combination of resin or beeswax was used to attach the hair to the head, and it was dyed all different kinds of colors, like gold, red, or black, and it's said that Cleopatra's favorite was peacock blue. Now, besides being fashionable, they were also functional in that they protected the head from the hot sun. Many Egyptians shaved their heads, in an attempt to keep pests at bay, so you can imagine how sensitive a bald scalp would have been in the desert. In addition to their functionality, they were also used to signify class. While most people owned at least one, wealthy women would own an assortment of ornate and decorative wigs, some of which were made from silver. The Greeks and Romans also used wigs and hair pieces, but theirs tended to look a little bit more realistic and natural. According to historians, Roman people initially associated blonde hair with prostitutes. In fact, besides paying their own taxes, working women were required to dye their hair blonde or wear a wig. As Greek culture and style permeated the mainstream, opinions shifted and suddenly blonde was in. A lot of that hair was brought in via the Germanic people as Roman slaved Gaul. Another tidbit that I learned while researching was that Romans also cultivated dark hair from slaves. And their source? India. It's kind of amazing that that's where many in the modern industry go to purchase hair too, but more on that in a few. When it came to the ancient people of the Far East in Japan and China, it was rare for an ordinary citizen to wear a wig unless, of course, you were an actor or maybe a geisha. During the Middle Ages, most women kept their heads covered, and with the rise of Christianity, wigs were kind of looked upon as symbols of the devil. But in the 15th century, men began to wear them as a way of concealing hair loss, and there was a trend that rose in popularity of pubic wigs called merkins, and they were used to cover up syphilis and gonorrheal warts. Gross. During the 16th and 17th century, wigs became more commonplace, with the wearers sporting them for hygienic and fashion reasons, and of course to cover up balding. The style for men was long curly hair past the shoulders, and as this trend evolved, skilled wig makers were sought out and held in high regard. In fact, the first wig makers guild was started in France in 1665, and many more like it spread across Europe. They were usually made from human hair, but sometimes goat and horse hair was also used. These wigs were uncomfortable heavy, and expensive. They were so much money, in fact, that gangs of wig thieves emerged, with some of them specializing in robbing passengers as they traveled by coach. The 18th century saw a surge of high powdered wigs with elaborate ringlets and designs. They were usually white, but sometimes they were colored violet, blue, yellow, or pink. In 1715, riots erupted in France because people were starving, and badly needed flour that was used for bread was being used by aristocrats to powder their wigs. Following these events, and then the death of the king, there was, once again, a decline in these elaborate wigs. Now, there were attempts to revive this fashion choice with different styles and less costly hair pieces being designed. It was during this time that the toupee was first used. And of course, the word toupee means tuft of hair in French. When it comes to high powdered wigs, the first person that most of us think about is Marie Antoinette. During her life, she was thought of as a fashion icon with many women in her court emulating her extraordinary style for themselves. It's almost ironic then that the French Revolution, an event that she had a hand in, in many ways, saw the end of wig popularity. They did stick around a little longer in the 19th century, but were usually worn by conservative men, most notably in the English courts. And if I'm not mistaken, that is a tradition that still carries on to this day. Women no longer wore their powdered wigs, but this didn't mean that they completely forewent their hair pieces. A clip-in called a postiche could be inserted into the hair discreetly. And this was a good thing, because while it used to be acceptable to proudly wear a wig, extra hair in one style was now something to hide at all costs. 
dress. Overall, the Victorians thought of wigs as they did false hair, meaning they weren't fashionable and those who wore them usually hid that from everyone except for their wig stylist. One of the sad truths of that time is the fact that if a woman wore a wig, it was usually to cover baldness as a result of syphilis. By the end of the 19th century, opinions shifted once again, with various publications like the Hairdresser's Weekly Journal stating that hair pieces for men should be thought of as a necessity rather than a vanity. This, of course, was not the case for many balding women who continued to wear their wigs in secret. According to my research, wigs made a comeback in 1915 when a stylist called Carita used them on her models at a Givenchy show. When Life magazine reported the story, wigs began to lose some of that stigma again. So by the 1950s and 60s, the wig industry had re-established itself. For many women, the convenience of dropping off their wig at their salon once a week for styling and then easy wearing was incredibly alluring. When Beatlemania took over, there was a sudden craze for wigs with the beetle cut. And just like in the 17th and 18th century, wig theft made a resurgence as people fell victim to wig buying scams. By the 20th century, wigs and hair pieces became even more common with celebrities and common average people wearing them alike. Hair is such an integral part of our self-perception, so it's really awesome that there are so many variants to pick and choose from. Whether you're a cancer patient in recovery, a sufferer of alopecia, or just a person with fine hair, you'll find that through a little bit of research, there's a wig or a piece out there just perfect for you. My first real experience with false hair came in grammar school. My best friend Dana, who is a black woman, had hair that came down to just about here, her shoulder. I remember listening to her talk about relaxing her natural hair, and it was through her that I learned what a weave was and learned about what a cornrow looked like. In fact, it was my friend Dana that taught me how to braid. We were huge fans of the singer Brandy, and everyone, including Dana, came to school with those long braids. I loved when she would braid the braids if that makes sense. If you're interested in learning more about the African-American perspective of wigs, weaves, and hairstyling, there's a really great documentary called Good Hair, and it's done by Chris Rock. I've seen it a few times, and it was actually through that film that I learned about where hair for purchase came from. Seems like Asian hair is the most desirable, and much of the outsourcing comes from India. So I guess we're not that different from the ancient Romans, are we? The movie also left me with a better understanding of what it's like to have a texture that's different from my own. So if you like political, historical, and social commentary all in one, I would definitely recommend that movie. I wish I could take more time to talk about wigs and hair pieces because I find the subject to be incredibly fascinating, but I feel like we'd be here forever. So for now, I'm going to stop and tell you about modern clip-in extensions and why I like them. So as I said earlier, there are many different kinds of hair pieces to choose from. If you aren't into the idea of wearing a wig or a sew-in weave, then clip-ins might be just what you're looking for. These kinds of extensions are non-invasive, non-committal, and that's because you can just clip them in and out of your hair. This is a single clip weft that I have from an older set. I've owned it for a while. As you can see, it's just a small expanse of hair that's been stitched together on a single line, and there's a solitary clip on the back. The word weft refers to this line, and while this has only one clip, you will find extensions that have more than one. The clip itself is relatively sturdy, and it has to be in order to keep the weft in your hair. There's a small little comb on the inside of the snap, and that helps to keep it in place, and there's usually a little bit of rubber under here too to aid in that grip. Extension sets are usually sold by length and weight, and that weight does have some bearing on how thick the extensions actually appear. If a 14 and an 18 inch set are both 200 grams, then they're both 200 grams. But the shorter ones may appear a little bit more dense than the longer ones. So that's just something to take in if you're looking to purchase. There are a couple of descriptions you should pay attention to as well. Ultimately, it might be worth it to consider a heavier set if you're looking for maximum volume, but of course that'll be up to your own discretion. If the hair has been acid dipped, you may want to look for another set. Acid dipped generally refers to the fact that the hair has been chemically stripped to avoid tangles. What you want is Remy hair. Remy hair is hair that's been sewn onto the weft with all of the cuticles facing down in the correct position. This means that the hair won't snag on a whim and it'll generally just appear a little bit nicer and more natural looking. If something's labeled cuticle intact, then that's good too. It just means that it hasn't been acid dipped 
and it's probably of good quality. Now, if the idea of wearing someone else's DNA freaks you out, there are synthetic versions of both extensions and wigs. Synthetic hair can be just as nice, or cheaper, but you might not be able to successfully color it or style it with hot tools. Just like with human hair, there are different tiers of quality, so if that's what you prefer, I'd suggest that you do some research and find a company that you really like. Synthetic hair is primarily composed of fine plastic and acrylic that's been strung into strands and manufactured to look like human hair. If you're ever confused about whether or not your extensions are real or synthetic, you can do the match test. Pluck out a single hair and put a flame against it. If it sparks orange, burns quickly, and smells like burnt flesh or feathers, it's real. Synthetic hair tends to burn, then melt, and it leaves a sticky residue. But for now, I'm going to turn my attention back to the human hair counterparts because that's generally what I prefer. Let's check out the set from Irresistible Me. Just like with the 8-in-1 curling wand set, I really like the packaging. It was different from other packs of hair that I've purchased, and when a company takes pride in their marketing, my opinion of their product is automatically upped a notch or two. Appearance matters. It's a solid cardboard box, and I really enjoyed the girl drawing on the inside cover. There's also some info directing customers to their Instagram, which I have visited, and it's definitely not one of those generic, here's pictures of wholesale bundles of hair for sale accounts. They're obviously focusing time and energy into selecting relevant and appealing photos. Not to mention, when Jenny from Confessions of a Hairstylist is following you, I think it's safe to say you're doing well. The hair itself came in an airtight package, which you can see I've sort of mangled, but just ignore that if you can. You can see that on the left there's a smaller pouch containing a single weft, and it seems like the company separates this one so that you can check out the color and length before committing yourself to keeping the rest. I thought that was a cool idea. The company sent me two different things, a 10-piece 200 gram set and their signature 4-clip weft. My color is Royal Golden Blonde number 14 and everything was 18 inches in length. So let me start with the 10-piece set. As you can see, there was a pretty standard variety of sizes here, with two 3-clip wefts, two 1-clip wefts, and five 2-clip wefts. Irresistible Me seems to charge according to both weight and length, with the longer and heavier sets costing a little more than the lighter and shorter ones. I just checked the website and this 18 inch 200 gram set is currently on sale for $202. The site is constantly holding sales which in my opinion results in all of their products feeling ultra reasonable. The first thing I noticed aside from how smooth and silky the hair felt were the ends. They weren't wispy, no splits, and they're pretty blunt across. I may actually have to thin them out a bit so that they won't overwhelm my natural hair. The other thing too was that the return was super minimal. These short little pieces that you often see at the top of a weft are what is known as the return hair. They usually occur when a weft is hand or machine sewn and they're normal. Sometimes the hair is folded over at the top while it's being secured onto a weft and depending on the brand some lines of hair have a ton of return hair and others like these don't. My rep Anna seemed really excited about the signature 4 clip piece in particular and she wanted me to direct my audience's attention to this specifically. After taking it out of the packaging, I completely understand why. The hair is totally outstanding in my opinion, and it's a solid, solid four-clip weft. But when you sort of open it up, you'll see that there's actually three wefts of hair attached to the lace. The first set I showed you guys was 200 grams, but this one piece is 60 grams, which is obviously less, but still it's a crap ton of hair. This is a great option for anyone who doesn't want to be bothered with multiple wefts, or maybe just wants additional volume in their bun or ponytail. It's also cheaper too. Again, mine was 18 inches and I just checked the site and it's currently on sale for $62 down from 87. I love this weft, it's amazing. Definitely Remy hair and like the others, the return is minimal and the ends are full and blunt. So let's put these in and see how they look. This is my hair just as it is and it's actually grown quite a bit this summer which I'm pretty happy about. I'm going to start with a large signature weft piece and I'm beginning this by dividing my crown into a U shape. Once it was pinned up, I opened the snaps and placed it right under the line and hooked it into my hair. One of my observations was that it is kind of heavy, but wow, it literally doubled my hair in an instance. It's also not an exact match in color, but it's pretty darn close, and I think it definitely added a little more dimension into the balayage that's already going on in my hair. Okay, so this is my hair without extensions in a ponytail, and then this is what the same ponytail looked like with the weft in place. And then this is my own hair in a simple braid, and then this is that same braid but with the weft. Definitely a difference in volume. 
Now I'm going to try the set with several pieces. I made a small horizontal divide at my nape and I'm putting a few puffs of dry shampoo onto my roots so that the clips won't slip. You can also use some hairspray here too or do a gentle tease. This will just ensure that everything is super secure during your day. And that's all there is to this. It's a series of partings in the hair and you can just hook in however many wefts you like. In some places I actually snapped in two at a time, one on top of the other. I used the single clip wefts on the sides of my head, just under my temples. Now the idea is to put them in, but also around the natural hair, so that they'll blend and won't appear overwhelming. You can wear these however you want and there's no one way to do this. You can also pick and choose pieces and you don't have to use your entire set if you don't want to. I think you can see how my volume has tripled, but because they're slightly longer than my own hair, the ends looked a tiny bit out of place. But one of the easiest ways to remedy this besides cutting them is to curl them. That should take care of any odd layering that occurs in this instance. And actually, that brings me to my next point. Human hair extensions are human hair, obviously, so they react almost the same way your own hair will. These are the clips I was just wearing, and I think you can see that they definitely will curl, so I imagine that if you use a straightener on them, it'll be just as successful as my wand was. I also wanted to take a moment to talk about how to wash these. They don't really need to be shampooed often, because it's not that they're really going to be dirty, but if you use a lot of product or you just want to freshen them up, you absolutely can. I'm using a one clip weft from the set to demonstrate this. I tend towards cool or lukewarm water, and you'll want to use a gentle shampoo. This particular variant is paraben and sulfate free, which is ideal in this scenario. You can see that I'm just putting a small amount in one hand, then lathering it in my palms and applying it to the weft. Don't scrunch your extensions. Be gentle and use the pads of your fingertips to direct the soap in a downwards motion so as to keep the cuticle smooth. I've heard tell that conditioner is optional, but I always follow up my shampoo with some, and you can probably use whatever you got in your shower. But personally, I'd recommend something that's extra moisturizing. And lastly, a leave-in conditioner is great. I'd probably keep away from oils just because they're a little messy and sometimes attract dirt. You don't want to wash these several times a week. Once or twice a month, depending on how many times you wear them in a week, should be sufficient. And you can use a towel to gently wring them out, but I prefer a paper towel. No reason really, just a weird quirk of mine, I guess. When it comes to drying them, the easiest thing you can do is hang them up and let them air out. You can use a clothesline, the back of a chair, or lay them flat on a towel. But I'm going to show you something different. When I've been in a rush, I've clipped them onto a beat up mannequin and used a hair dryer with a carbon comb, which is basically just a heat resistant comb, or a boar bristle round brush. I don't use a ceramic brush with these because they get super hot during a blowout and I don't want to risk burning my extension hair since, you know, it doesn't grow back. The settings on my dryer are usually warm or cool and medium air, never hot and never on high blast, and I always point my nozzle down so as not to mess up the cuticles. When it comes to storing your extensions, you probably want to treat them as you would your favorite formal dress. They aren't made of glass, but you do want to put some thought into their care. I tend towards satin or silk pouches like this, but in some cases I have used plain old Tupperwares. Basically, you just want to keep them dry and clean and out of the way of constant sunlight. So like, don't leave them on your windowsill or something. Like all beauty products, extensions can wear away, but if you take some time caring for them, they'll last longer. In terms of brushing them out, I like to use my Japanese cutting comb because I think that the wide teeth are perfect and a little less abrasive than a hairbrush. Although I have had girlfriends swear by their boar bristle brushes. So what if they're too long? Well, you can take them to your hairdresser and have him or her put them into your hair and then cut them uniform to your length. The ones from Irresistible Me are a little longer than my own hair, but I think I'm not going to do that. I'm just going to let my hair catch up with my extensions. If you're confused about matching your color, you can log on to Irresistible Me. They have a video tutorial there along with dozens of YouTube reviews of all of their products. However, it's my opinion that you should always go lighter. You can always bring them to your salon and have them dyed to match your color. But if all else fails and it's just really not right, the company does seem to have a very reasonable return and exchange policy. One of the first things that I asked my rep Anna was where the hair comes from. And that's because it's really important to me that I'm not wearing hair that's been hacked off someone's head forcibly. According to Anna, all of the hair comes from India and I'm going to quote her here. She says, we pay a huge amount of attention to the way the hair is sourced. It is crucial that our hair extensions are sourced in an ethical way. Women selling their hair to Irresistible Me 
always do it happily of their own will. That's really good to hear. Irresistible Me puts a lot of emphasis on that and ethics is a top priority for us. Good to hear. Other observations I made of this site included the fact that there are full lace wigs and tape-in extensions for sale as well. There's even a signature weft that you can customize if you want an ombre. Overall, these are definitely something that I would recommend to a girlfriend, especially if she said she was looking for a good set. They're clearly high quality, come in nice packaging from a very easy to navigate website. As with the curling wand that I reviewed, I did receive a discount code which I will include in the underbar. Anyway, I hope you all enjoyed listening to me ramble on and on today. As a modern hairdresser, I'm definitely interested in the history of wigs and hair pieces, so if you have any questions or thoughts, I'd love to hear them in the comments below. So until next time everybody, I hope you're having a great day and I will see you soon. Bye!